I now call upon John Goodchrist to address us for 15 minutes. Thank you, Shabir, for your talk. I enjoyed it to hear your interpretation of the Quran, subject of peace and violence. And um, I'm sure all of us here as Christians and Muslims this evening must be aware that just our gathering here is somewhat unique. You don't often see a gathering of both sides, Christians, Muslims, just mixing with each other, sitting with each other peacefully, listening to matters of religion, our different, at times, points of view being discussed among us. A a spirit that everybody present afterwards, I know, came up to me at the Durban debate, and Muslim and Christian, and just expressed their appreciation of just how well the debate went. And I just look at an uh, audience like this this evening, and I say to myself how wonderful it would be if this could be the Christian-Muslim interaction all the time, all over the world. What a wonderful world it would be if we could eschew violence completely. Um, I go back to those words of James. I keep thinking of them. The anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. I just want to say a few words in closing on the question of what the Christian attitude is generally in terms of what Jesus taught us, how we should, as Christian people, look at the outside world and people we mix with. When Israel uh, turned against God, people of Israel turned against each other, and even turned away from God to idol worship, I think the Lord looked at it and said, no point in protecting them. It's a human problem. uh, All over the world, the proneness to violence, to to rebellion, and so on against God, the proneness to coldness towards our fellow men is a human problem, and it's got to be addressed as one. It's not a Muslim issue. It's not a Christian issue. It's something common to humanity. But when God elected to bring in the new covenant in the Bible where he offered to forgive the sins of all those who had sinned against him. <clears throat> and even as the Christian scriptures hold that he would take the consequence of sin on himself. The way I see it is that he elected to come into the world, live among his people, send them out into the whole world with a message of good news and with no right whatsoever to use any means of violence to promote that in contrast to what the Romans did, the Roman Catholic Church did in the Middle Ages. In other words, quite simply, God renounced the use of violence to further religious aims. It's as simple as that. When Jesus came into the world, I think it's commonly known that Jesus himself avoided all forms of violence. Not only that, it wasn't just because he you might say, well, he was in a weak position, he couldn't resort to violence. Oh, many people in his position did and still do to this day. But what he did <clears throat> was simply, even though he uh, could perform miracles to benefit anybody, was simply never to use any power that he had, those immense powers that he had, to protect or benefit himself. And in that he sends us an example. When the Apostle Peter saw the Romans coming to arrest him, he said to Jesus, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And he took his sword out and he struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And I think it's John's Gospel says that Jesus said no more of this and he touched his ear and healed him. So that even there, even the people who'd come to arrest him, Jesus used his healing powers to heal the person who had been injured rather than to protect himself. Instead of executing violence, he took it on himself without reacting against it. Jesus said in the words we read earlier this evening in Matthew 5 verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Not the peace lovers, not people who just sit back and hope that everything will go well for them without being offended or offending anyone else. Peacemakers, people who genuinely strive to bring peace between God and man and between men and their fellow men. You've heard it was said, Jesus said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist one who is violent. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the left also. If anyone would sue you and have your coat, a cloak, let him have your coat as well. If they compel you to go one mile, go two miles. I don't think this was an exhortation to us to simply stand back and let people trample all over you. Um, I agree with Shabir generally that when you are attacked, when, uh, when, when a, a, a hostile force invades your country, you're entitled to defend yourself. In fact, you should. I don't have any problem with that. The problem that I see is when the causes of religion are advanced through deliberate violence. There I have a problem. <clears throat> but in this case, 
I look at it like this. Uh, Jesus went on to say, be as wise as serpents and be as innocent as doves. Um, from a Christian point of view, I, he, he never said, be as gullible as dodos. He didn't mean that we must just sit back and allow the world to walk all over us, not at all. But when it comes from a Christian point of view, when evil is coming your way, don't resist it means don't return evil for evil. Don't return eye for eye. Don't think you now have a justification because of a perceived wrong to you that you've become a victim. And as a victim, you can have a sort of persecution mentality and you're entitled to fight back and treat him in exactly the same way he treated you. Again, Jesus said, you've heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. This is Matthew 5:43. But I say to you, <clears throat> love your enemies. That had never been heard before. Pray for those who abuse you. Bless those who hate you. You find throughout the scriptures as well, in 1 Peter 2.23, for example, teaching about Jesus that just sums up who he was. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he was suffered, he did not threaten, but he trusted to him who judges justly. And that is set as a clear example to all Christians as the only way in which they can respond as Christians to the world outside. According to the New Testament, after his resurrection... He only appeared to people who had already believed in him. He could have gone right in front of Pontius Pilate, Caiaphas, all of those who had arrested him and nailed him to the cross. He could have said to them, here I am, I'm raised from the dead, with all the power of God at my disposal, and wait and see what happens next. <laughs> no, no, God defers judgment. The Bible says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, says uh, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, if your enemy is hungry, give him food, just as uh, Shabir read this evening. Uh, if he is thirsty, give him drink, because by so doing you, he burning coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That can be the only Christian attitude, even in the worst situation, when your Christian faith or when anything that you have or possess as a Christian is being threatened because of your faith in God and your belief in Jesus. As a disciple of Jesus, that's the only response you can have. We are called to follow him. We're called to be imitators of him. And when I look as a Christian, whether you believe in the crucifixion of Jesus or not, as a Christian, I do believe in it. But when I see it, I say to myself that if that is what God did for me, to deliver me from my sins and to settle the issue between me so that he no longer has any uh, wrath or anything in his heart towards me, well, the cross of Christ takes away my right to dislike anybody. I can't. As a Christian, I cannot have a malicious attitude to people. I may not like the way some people do things. I see people doing things all the time and I certainly don't like them, but <laughs> like what they're doing, but I cannot dislike them personally. I can never take up <clears throat> a spirit of maliciousness or vindictiveness towards them, especially if the injury is being done to me. Because if you react out of malice, if you react out of vindictiveness, then you're no different to the person who is injuring you and harming you. As I said, we're not called to be as gullible as dodos. We're not called to be tramped on and walked on. If somebody legally infringes your rights, there are legal means of restoring those rights. If people falsely accuse you in courts, you've got other ways and means of, uh, in terms of law to defend yourself, and justly so. You're not called to just take everything that is thrown at you. But you are called as a Christian not to react in kind when anything is done towards you in violence, to return violence as the best way of sorting the problem out. <laughs> well, that's why I quoted all those incidents and explanations to you uh, of what happened in the Middle Ages and elsewhere, because as I look at it today, I mean, I'm horrified at what was done in the name of the religion of Jesus. Uh, I can't think of anything that was in further contrast to what Jesus taught. Many years ago, this goes back more than 20 years ago, I was here in Lanasia and I was driving past the Sabri Mosque here just up in, uh, just off Flamingo Street, quite close by. And there was an Islamic conference being held and I saw a big sign on the outside and it had Islam, I-S-L-A-M. And alongside with these words, I shall love all mankind. And I thought about it and I thought, well, that sums it up. And then I just went one further and I thought, I've got a Christian response to that. I shall love all Muslims. <laughs> now, wherever I've been ever since, I've gone and I've said to Christians and I've time and again and I've Say it to myself all the time, that whenever you hear the word Islam, don't think negatively, don't think militantly, don't react. And boy, they do. Well, 
I said, just remind yourself of one thing. The word Islam to a Christian can only mean I shall love all Muslims. We just don't have the right to have any other attitude towards you. In one... In 1 Corinthians 16 verse 14, the Apostle Paul says, Let all that you do be done in love. It can never be an intention to injure or harm another person for our benefit. It can never be done under the name of love. Uh, Christians are called to have a benevolent attitude to all people and not to take any satisfaction in putting another person down and gaining the edge on him. Jesus said in John 18:36. My kingdom is not of this world. If it was of this world, my servants would fight that I might not be handed over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. <clears throat> and then again, the Apostle Paul, in the words that I read to you from Romans 12, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, because it is written, uh, If your enemy is hungry, give him food. If he is thirsty, give him drink. Uh, that is the, must be the attitude to Christians when people are doing harm to you. Again, I qualify that and I say this does not mean that you as a Christian or, or that people of the world can say, well, these Christians are just soft and, they, and, and, and they're pliable. We can tramp all over them. No, we have rights. If people deliberately harm us, deliberately injure us, if somebody breaks into my home, somebody comes and steals things out of my home, I have every right to go to law, to have the person prosecuted, to have them convicted and to have them dealt with in terms of the justice of law. But I do not have the right personally to bear a malicious attitude to that person and to take the law into my own hands and return eye for eye. John warned in his gospel, uh, Jesus warned in John's gospel 16 verse 2. He said, the hour will come when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. And that's one of the strangest things, as I say, in, in the history of the world, that people can think that in the name of God, that they can, do, that they can simply take up the sword or whatever it is and injure and harm or if even go so far as annihilating other people. For us as Christians, one of the reasons why I think we so often lose sight of this and we start thinking in militant terms and self-protective terms <clears throat> is that we forget what we're called to be. Um, I so often hear that Christianity is about the church. It's about being part of the church, about joining the church and about be submitting to the leadership of the church. There's an element of truth in that, but it, it just sounds too much like the Middle Ages where the church assumed the authority over the Christian world, the Christian people, and then executed it forcefully and people weren't allowed to think for themselves. As I see it in the New Testament, every Christian is called to be an individual disciple of Jesus Christ, first and foremost. Everything else follows. But I have the conviction that if we all did, if all Christian people who know the Lord just had this attitude, I am a disciple of Jesus first. And we sat down and we read what Jesus said and about our attitude to our fellow men, things would change. Uh, we, would, we would have a much greater impact on the world. <clears throat> Too often we confuse um, our discipleship with Jesus with national interests, material interests, vested interests, community interests, and we think that we've got to protect community or protect the nation and have, you know, and, and have our Christian way imposed on other people. I read recently when I was in America, a number of Christian people I've read in things and saying this in all seriousness, that America should be a Christian country and that the American government, we should work to make sure that the American government imposes the Christian value system on the country. And my heart sinks. You can't do that. You, you don't have the right as a Christian to impose things on other people because once you do, you're assuming power into your hands, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely and we're going back to the Middle Ages, won't be long before things happen then happen again. True peace is to be reconciled to God and to hold an attitude of love towards all other men in our hearts and it would be to me a wonder if as Christians we could always do that, believe it and practice it. There's no room for arrogance or violence in the Christian dictionary. I go back to those words of James, which I commend to you all for the third time because they strike me all the time. The anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. Thank you. Thank you, John, for the interesting 15 minutes. Shabir, could we have your response? In my response, I, I want to just simply raise two questions. 
uh, for seven and a half minutes and then uh, offer the remaining seven and a half minutes uh, to my friend John to, to help me with those questions to, so, because I want to know his answers. Um, the first issue is um, the issue that John himself raised. We have uh, passages in, in the Bible, especially Joshua 6, verse 21, and he mentioned uh, other passages from the book of Joshua, chapter 8, verse 25, and so on, that speak about the, destru- the destruction of Jericho and then of Ai. Now, in the case of Ai, I believe he said there were 12,000 people who were put to the sword. But all of this was done with the sanction of God. And when John mentioned these events, I can see some hesitation, because as a Christian, as a peace-loving person, uh, he, he must have some difficulty with this. So what I want to know is, how do you reconcile uh, these passages of the Bible with the Christian um, faith today? Uh, Related to this, and and as part of the same question, we have to think more carefully about the destruction of the Canaanites. Uh, This was, as far as we can tell from the Bible, an unprovoked sort of destruction. Uh, John's point is that God has the right to do this. God could have destroyed them in some way. He could annihilate them. He could send an earthquake, hurricane, whatever. He could destroy them by some other means that we might refer to as natural acts or God's acts. Uh, But instead, he allowed the the Israelites to exterminate them, uh, rather instructed the Israelites to exterminate these people. But how is that different from uh, some people somewhere in the world exterminating some others and saying, well, God told us to do this? How can we be so sure that they're acting on behalf of God? Uh, are they not uh, apparently acting on behalf of their own self-interest to claim some land? The book of Genesis in chapter 15 says that God gave a certain piece of land to Abraham to be inherited by the Israelite people. Uh, and uh, what, were to, what was to be done with the people who were there in the land already? The Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, and so on. Ten groups of people who were named. Well, the answer from the Bible is that they are to be exterminated. Now, this seems, of course, on the surface to be wrong, and I would just like to know how John might uh, justify that. So that's my, my first uh, issue. The second issue about, uh, is about Jesus. Didn't Jesus really, uh, in a way, um, continue the same sort of program which was already established in the Old Testament, but with, a, with the variety that now he could only uh, fight a sort of spiritual warfare in the meantime, battling against the demons uh, and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, whereas, in fact, he did not have the political power, so he could not uh, continue to fight military battles now. But the book of Revelation does have it that Jesus will return and he will rule with the iron scepter. Uh, and that uh, he will have a sword coming out of his mouth. I don't know how best to interpret that, but uh, sometimes we speak about a person being armed to the teeth. Is this what the visionary of Revelation has in mind, that Jesus comes back and uh, he, he has a sword coming out of his mouth, and with that sword he conquers and slaughters his enemies, such that his, um, his, his cloak will be draped with, or dripping with blood, but does that mean the blood of his own sacrifice, or is this the blood of his enemies? And we, we have the New Testament depiction of Jesus as the Davidic son, uh, as the, the Messiah, the son of David. Uh, and it, the, Messiah, the, the Davidic Messiah was expected to rule in the place of David, which means that he would sit on a throne and rule. Uh, the New Testament Gospels uh, uh, have it that uh, uh, the passage from the 110th Psalm actually applies to Jesus, where the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. But here we have the image of a conquering king sitting on a throne, and he's resting his feet on the slain bodies of his enemies. So what we have in, in the Gospels is uh, an overall depiction of Jesus as the Prince of Peace, but at the same time, uh, these are, are, are combined with uh, uh, sprinklings 
of reflections on Jesus as a real conquering king. Uh, the expectation of a Davidic Messiah was that he would overthrow Roman rule. And it would seem that Jesus did not deny in the New Testament this role for himself. In Acts of the Apostles, when his disciples asked him, uh, are you going to now um, uh, restore Israel, uh, he gave an answer to the effect that it is not for you to know the time and place. He didn't deny that this would occur. He, he, he just uh, is evasive about when exactly it will occur. Uh, one might look at this from a historical point of view and say that uh, obviously he didn't do it. He was not successful. He did not have the power. But perhaps if he had the power, uh, something else might have manifested. Uh, now, if we look at it this way, we have uh, some interesting sayings. He's saying, do not think I have come to bring peace. I have come not to bring peace but the sword. In uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 27, uh, he uh, paints a picture about a returning king. Uh, who, when he comes back, will say, As for those who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. His instruction to the disciples to sell their whatever they had and buy swords is interesting. Uh, we, we should think of the original saying of Jesus, and we should think of how it now appears in, in the Bible, and we should think of tensions between different parts of the, of the statements. This statement itself, sell what you have and buy swords, is puzzling uh, if the overall uh, reflection is one of peace. Of course, it ends by saying that the disciples announce that they have two swords, and he says it is enough. So the, obviously, there's not going to be a major confrontation here. But you could have a situation where Jesus says this, which uh, announces a major confrontation, and then the later writers, uh, reflecting on this, realizing that there couldn't have been a major confrontation, soften uh, the situation by saying, okay, two swords would have been e enough. Uh, so when we put all of these together, that Jesus was to be this uh, Davidic Messiah, uh, doesn't that mean that he continues the same program? So there are two questions, really. Uh, first, uh, doesn't the depiction of God instructing the Israelites to exterminate the Canaanites and the Hivites and Jebusites and so on in the Bible, doesn't that pose a moral problem for, for a Christian reading his Bible today? And uh, second, uh, isn't Jesus really in a subtle way, despite the overall uh, flavoring of the Gospels presenting him as the, peace, the Prince of Peace, isn't he actually continuing the same program uh, which will culminate in the final battle, the Battle of Armageddon, in which he himself comes back and slays his enemies and then rules them with the iron scepter. So these are my two questions for seven and a half minutes, and I'd like to hear John's uh, answer uh, for, for the other seven and a half. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shabir. These are not easy questions, in a sense, to answer, <clears throat> simply because there's sometimes things about God that I don't know, can't comprehend, I can't penetrate right into the mind of God to see precisely how he thinks. Recently, Karen Armstrong uh, has suggested in a book, I don't know if you know who she is, she's a well-known writer, written a book on Muhammad, another one on Holy War, and written a book on the Bible, she's a well-known British author. She recently has broached something, put a foot right out, boldly outside the door and said, why do we always think that God is good? <clears throat> Isn't this the biggest, oh, here it is, Karen Armstrong book that she wrote, The Battle for God. I think this is the actual book that I'm quoting. <clears throat> she said, why do we always think that God is good? This is the biggest mistake that we've made in history to think that God is always good. And she launches into a very uh, powerful case to say that if human beings are regarded as good and evil when they do certain things, shouldn't we feel the same way about God? For example, that not only did he tell the Israelites to wipe out all nations, including the Amalekites that were in Israel, but centuries later, about three or four centuries later, after only a few Amalekites had survived because they hadn't wiped them all out and they were living at peace and uh, Israel was at peace and it was a... Uh, another generation, that God then turned around and said, you haven't finished the job, and sent Saul off, told Saul through the prophet Samuel to go and finish it and to destroy the remaining Amalekites. So when he even brought the king back and uh, um, alive against the commandment of God, God was angry with him yet again. And just, uh, things like these that make Karen Armstrong say, isn't God, doesn't he show a, a, a sort of chip on his shoulder, a grudging attitude? 
like I said, I don't penetrate deep into the mind of God and, and for that reason I take as things come and I read them and I study them and I perceive them as I see them. To answer these two questions as best as I can, how do you reconcile <clears throat> what is in the book of Joshua with Christianity today? Um, it's a long story, but the way I, I put it in my book, Designed for a Purpose, I've written a whole chapter moving from one to the other. The way I see it is that, the, that as I said in, I think it was Durban on Tuesday, the prime nature of God is his righteousness. And to, when people sin against that, they invoke his wrath. And God is just to act and God is just to judge and that nobody can hold him to, to account when he judges sin and reacts accordingly. And at the beginning of history, that is what we see. God putting forward against Satan and his demons when they sinned in heaven, angels of light and rebelled against God. He committed them to pits of nether gloom, never to be forgiven again and to be shown no mercy at all. Yet what I see right through the Bible is that <clears throat> as time goes along, and as I showed, the love of God begins to work itself out from the depth of his being. And as it does, it's what the Greeks call agape love. That means sacrificial love, self-denying love, which is not something that's easy for anybody to have. And with God, it worked itself out despite the sins of the people against him. So that when he finally offered, as we see it in Jesus, the hand of complete grace and mercy, God was going against himself. God took the penalty of that against himself. Basically, what I'm saying is that God has the right to act at any time and to call any human being to account. And the Bible says that the penalty of sin is death that no human being is, has the right to live forever if he lives in a sinful life in a rebellious condition of disobeying God continuously. And the nations around Israel had rejected him completely. They, they had turned to idol worship. They had turned to some of the most abominable practices. And the purpose of God was that the Israelites should not be distracted and not be turned away to becoming the same sort of thing that God would have a people for his own. In, in one sense, yep, I can swallow when I read that 12,000 people were slaughtered at AI. And yet on the other side, I can see for myself that God being who he is, having the right to judge at any time, would have the right to act against a nation, even as he did at the time of Noah when he acted against a whole human race, barring just a few people, and wiped them out and said, uh, the, 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 this human race, the Lord said, saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and every thought of his heart was only evil continually. He had the right, in fact, to have wiped the whole earth out and called it to judgment. But he kept Noah alive, he kept his family alive as God's purposes of grace and mercy were to be worked out in time to come. To put it sort of in the only way I can do it, there are two hands to God. There's a one side, the wrath of God against all sin of mankind, and the Bible says that it is revealed against all manner of wickedness of men. The other side, the hand of grace that extends to man the hope of forgiveness and mercy if man will turn to God and repent. Um, the one can bring the perfect forgiveness of all your sins and take you into his glory. The other can certainly bring without that repentance the judgment of God upon you. The other one about Jesus, the question that um, should be asked, uh, he did not have political power in his day, and yet the book of Revelation tends to indicate that having that power, he ruled with a rod of iron and so on. <clears throat> I've read Revelation many times, and I'm going to explain that passage in the way that I heard Shabir explain the verses of the Quran uh, in terms of uh, verses like these, slay the unbelievers wherever you find them. You'll find many writers will take a very negative attitude to that and say that the Quran is just giving the Muslims a sort of blank check to slaughter anybody who gets in their way if they don't follow Islam. Shabir gave us a very different interpretation of that. I don't see any need to challenge him on that this evening. Uh, he's quite entitled as a Muslim to express that. And I can only give you my own interpretation of this this evening. The way I see it again is this, that Christians believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that in Matthew 25, Jesus said that before him, all the nations of the world would be gathered. He would separate them as the uh, sh sheep are separated from the goats. And to the one side, he will say, come into my eternal kingdom and to the rest depart into the eternal fires forever and ever. People today have a problem with the subject of hell. They have a problem with the subject of judgment. But it's something that Jesus taught. Um, during his lifetime, as I said, he did have means to exercise power if he wanted to. If he wanted to exercise any kind of power, he had his miraculous power, which he never used for himself, only 
for the benefit of others. At one point, when uh, I think when Simon Peter slo- uh, struck the um, uh, slave of the high priest and, and uh, cut off his ear, Jesus said, I think it was then, he said, um, do you not think that I can call on my father right now and he will send me 12 legions of angels to deliver me? But then how should the scriptures be fulfilled? Now, as we see it as Christians, Jesus knew, Son of Man goes as it is written of him, knew why he'd come, knew he'd come to lay his life down, to open up what, we, what to me is a golden age, the, the, the new covenant age where God extends the hands of grace to people. But that in time, if they do not take it now, then they will face the judgment of God. They will face the wrath of God. And that side of Jesus is quite clear even in the Gospels. If you just read, for example, Matthew 23, the way Jesus spoke to the religious leaders of his day, you hypocrites, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? And if you read that chapter, you'll see how forceful Jesus could be in taking on people who are very religious but very hypocritical at the same time. So the way I see it is simply this, that the picture in Revelation is one of Jesus ruling over the eternal kingdom as the Messiah, the son of David forever and ever, and that the enemies of God who refuse to repent, who refuse to submit to his will, will certainly be brought into subjection, be brought into judgment, and be brought into submission to him for all eternity, and will be brought into the consequence of their sins. And in that sense, he'll rule them with a rod of iron. But that in this age, at a time where God could have done differently, where Jesus could have done differently. While we live, he offers to us the hand of his salvation and shows us the depth of God's heart. Thank you very much. We we now come to the question and answer period.